All right, folks, I got six o'clock. Let's start moving. So at 6 p.m., I call this meeting in Saginaw City Council to order. Uh, this is a specially called meeting with uh, basically one item on the agenda, uh, the new public improvement district. So this is a little different. We will dispense with some of the normal formalities. Would like the record to reflect. We do have a quorum. Welcome back, Mr. Farr. I'm glad you're back healthy and happy. Thank you, sir. Honorary as ever, so I'm glad to have you. Um, we will, uh, as I said, discuss the, the PID project here on this agenda. Um, folks at home, if you can hear me, if you have questions, uh, this is a different, uh, different kind of meeting. If you have any questions about this special meeting, please contact our city manager, Gabe. Uh, he can certainly fill you in on what we talk about. So audience participation, I don't see any other audience except for presenters, so I won't dispense with that. Though if you do want to speak on listed item agendas, you're certainly allowed to. So, uh, item number three, I believe, is the presentation by Providence. Uh, so we'll start there. Or Gabe, you want to preamble anything before we get going? You know, if I may request, Mayor, we may have um, item four go first, just to go through the um, pit administrator's um, presentation first, and then we can have the, um, the applicant present. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Kyle Skorsky. I'm with P3 Works. We are a public improvement district administrator and consultant here in the state of Texas. Uh, we are officed in North Richland Hills, uh, about 20 minutes away. Uh, we also have an office in Austin, Texas as well. We service the entire state and appreciate the time tonight. So moving just straight into it, um, if you have any questions, I'm just going to keep going, but if you have questions throughout, Feel free to just interrupt me. I'm sure there will be plenty. I'll try to keep it as interesting as possible. Um, so let's keep this interactive. Feel free to keep the questions coming. Uh, a public improvement district, uh, it's governed by Chapter 372 of the Local Government Code. Uh, that's where you'll find the legal statute. Essentially what a PID is is, in, is it is an economic development tool that the city has. If you've heard of 380 agreements, if you've heard of tax increment reinvestment zones, this is another tool that the city has for economic development. Uh, you'll just see on the screen basically the same thing. Um, this economic development tool is a little bit different than other ones that you might be used to because there is an assessment that is placed specifically on the property. Um, it does not affect your general or maintenance and operation fund. The goal of a PID is to never have a single cent be paid for the creation of a PID or the administration of a PID through your general fund. Uh, there's an item later on on the agenda tonight um, approving a reimbursement agreement for professional services. That is put up uh, in cash by the developer up front to pay for our services, to pay for your bond council, your financial administrator, underwriter, underwriter council, all of the different players you have on the team, there will be costs that are incurred as we look at the potential of setting up this PID. The developer is agreeing to front those costs and pay for those costs so that the city council is, or the city is not responsible for any of that. So that's a very important point up front. Um, but a PID, really at the end of the day, like I said, economic development uh, incentive tool, it promotes timely acquisition, design, construction, and implementation and also allows for a city to really choose their team and who um, is controlling this PID. Um, it is controlled by the city. It's not like a MUD where it's a separate governmental entity. The city is the de facto board. Uh, if you create it, it's usually around for the next 30 years. You will be in charge of administering that PID for the next 30 years, but you are the ones that are responsible for making this, the decision actually choosing to approve the PID, actually approving the assessment that is placed on that property, how much it is all controlled through the city. Moving on, uh, and just a little further about what is a PID and what they're able to do. The main use of a PID is to fund public infrastructure, uh, be it roads, water, sewer, storm drainage, parks, open space. It funds public infrastructure that will be at some point owned by the city in order to free up dollars for the developer to go and spend elsewhere in his development. So um, the big two words that you'll really hear all the time, and it's actually in the statute, is that but for the PID, this 
development would not be possible. So this is not just a grant you're giving the developer to go and have extra money. It is a tool that is freeing up dollars for the developer to go and install infrastructure that might be a higher standard that what you're, than what you're used to. Uh, design, uh, design standards can be increased if you want wider trails, if you want amenity centers, all those things can be negotiated through development agreement in return for the PID. And so it's a very important tool. It's a tool that the city can decide if they want to or if they do not want to use. Uh, so always do keep that in mind. But again, it is overseen by the city for the next 30 years if you chose to uh, do this. So just understand it's a very large administrative task to take on, but that's why we're here to help as well. Um, on the next page, why, do you, why, you use, why utilize a PID? Um, really have gone over a lot of this already. Um, another big tool that people, that cities use it for is for annexation of property. As you know with uh, the recent Senate bills, it's harder to annex property into your city. And so you can offer annexation and development agreement in, re in return for um, a public improvement district. Uh, but otherwise, uh, but for the creation of the PID, you'll see that underlined again. Um, but for the creation of the PID, Superior plans, design, architecture, building materials, all these things are possible now that would not be possible but for the creation of this PID. Uh, it can also free up dollars for the developer to go install other private amenities that might not be owned by the city, but by paying for some of the public infrastructure, now you have the developer has dollars available to build uh, private amenities like pools, playgrounds if they have a fitness center, enhanced trail system, whatnot, if it's privately owned, now that dollars are freed up uh, for the developer to go and spend that money. Any questions so far? Great. Big picture considerations on the next page. Uh, I've already gone over a couple of them. PIDs are not separate political subdivision. Uh, you are the ones that are responsible for administering that. Um, I'll have a slide in just a minute on what exactly is inclusive of that. Um, but they, essentially there is a service and assessment plan that is created that is the governing document that lives and breathes over the next 30 years. And city council will approve what's called an annual service plan update every year, giving update on the PID and the uh, annual installment that's actually placed on the tax roll. Uh, so there is a slight administrative burden, but again, um, not a single cent will come from your general fund to pay for that. And also administrative expenses can be charged solely to the PID and paid through those annual installments um, to pay for a PID administrator's fee. Uh, like I said before as well, grows the city's tax base without obligating city revenues. So something like a 380 agreement, you're dedicating part of your sales tax to go and pay for uh, whatever improvements are installed. At TERS, you're giving part of your ad valorem dollars away. A PID is a separate lien that is placed on the property that is paid back by the property owner of it over a set period of time if it is not prepaid. And so you are still collecting full city sales tax. You're still collecting full city property taxes as well. And so it does not affect that in any way. Um, and like I said, those PIDs can be used to forward the city's comprehensive plan, thoroughfare plan, and parks plan by freeing up dollars with the developer to be able to go and actually install um, those plans and that the, the city has in the future. On the next page, this, I won't go into too much detail over this. There's four main ways you can go about uh, creating a PID and actually funding a PID. The first is a reimbursement PID. Uh, this is where a developer fronts the cash and actually installs the infrastructure on his own penny and is reimbursed over time through the annual installments that are collected on the PID. He's, uh, you agree at some interest rate uh, to reimburse them for that, um, usually 2 to 5% above the bond index rate. So if you're looking at 3% right now, it would be something like a 5% or it goes up to 8 or 9% reimbursement agreement, just depending on where bond rates are at right now, but they're historically low right now. Uh, second option you have is a reimbursement PID to a bonded PID. That is where the developer fronts the cash up front, but once the infrastructure is installed, you sell bonds uh, on the PID and cash out the developer. Uh, so they, once you do that, it's generally seen as a less risky investment um, since the infrastructure is already in the ground, and so you can usually sell those bonds at a lower interest rate. 
Your third option is a bare land bond PID. That is where bonds are sold up front at the beginning of the project to help uh, finance those improvements, not on the developer's dime. Uh, those are generally viewed a little bit more risky because you're selling bonds whose only collateral is the land itself. PID bonds that are issued do not come back to the city's general fund. They are not backed by any city funds at all. They are only backed by the land itself. And so when you issue bonds on uh, an empty piece of property, it's generally viewed as higher risk, and so you have higher interest rates at that time. The fourth one, and it is an operations and maintenance PID. We're not necessarily looking at that tonight, but it's something to just know and have in your quiver at the same time um, that you can also uh, levy an additional assessment on a PID to pay for the maintenance of the public infrastructure that's installed, and it can also pay for public services that are performed within a PID. So oftentimes we have DPS services and roadway maintenance that is done. All that can be financed as well. Um, the ongoing maintenance over the next 30 years can be financed through a PID uh, if the council so chose to do that as well. Any questions on those? Y'all are making this see too easy for me. Next page, uh, this, like I mentioned before, there's quite an administrative burden when dealing and administering a PID. Uh, off to the right-hand side, you'll just see, it's kind of small, I'll, I apologize, but there are quite a few tasks involved in administering this PID over the next 30 years, um, and more so if you were to issue bonds as well. Uh, but again, all that can be paid for through uh, collection costs through the PID. You're not ever charging any of your citizens outside of this PID for this PID. They are not having to subsidize it at all. It is all being paid through the assessments. Uh, but just some of the general tasks, uh, we prepared that annual service plan update. Like I mentioned, if you issue bonds, you have quarterly developer disclosures. So long as they own more than 20% of the property usually, you, you'll also have an annual issue disclosure that you, the city, have to prepare. Uh, all this has to get uploaded to the official um, bond market website, Emma. Um, we also go and prepare monthly bond fund reports that show um, every month we send to your financial uh, director and your financial advisor what the status of uh, all the accounts are with the trustee. Uh, you also get a lot of questions when it comes dealing with the PID, be it new residents, be it title companies, be it realtors. We handle all of those questions. We have a website that is searchable. So uh, if we created this PID, we would upload all of its creation documents, all the property IDs would get uploaded each year with their outstanding assessment, the annual installment, the actual breakdown of the annual installment with further links to view bond documents and that annual service plan update that I mentioned before. So they can go and search all that and they can also contact us and we prepare any disclosures or home buyer disclosures um, that are necessary in the sale and the transfer of property. Um, the biggest thing we run into in dealing and administering PIDs, the biggest complaint is people don't know that they existed. And so our number one goal is information and getting information out and being as transparent as possible about this PID. And so that comes in conjunction working with your city staff, you know, be it up, you know, putting links to our website on your website. Um, we make sure that we work with the developer and go out there and um, make sure that they are disclosing disclosing if there are if there's residential homes, disclosing in their model homes that they're in a PID. We do PID 101s with um, their seller agents. We'll answer questions from realtors and title companies. Um, we hand out all of our administrative cards. We'll just give a huge bundle to the developer and to the builders to make sure that our name is getting out there so that your staff is not um, having to field calls. They're just pointing all their calls directly to us and we're happy to answer any of those calls, we have a live person answering every business day, 9 to 5, and if uh, we miss their call, we uh, get back with them the next business day. So we offer all of those services, but it is quite a large administrative burden thinking about dealing with this over the next 30 years. Um, a developer is going to come in for a couple years and leave you, the city, are the ones responsible for managing it. And so it is a big responsibility, but we're happy to walk with you along the way. Next page, uh, financial implications for the city. 
The PID debt, if you were to issue bonds, the PID debt is non-recourse to the city. Uh, we are, first of all, we are not financial advisors. You have a financial advisor, Mark McClenney. He is not available to be here tonight, but he would be happy to answer more questions um, regarding this, but this is just a brief overview. It's non-recourse to the city. Like I said before, that PID assessment is placed on the land, and the lien transfers with the owner of the property. And so if principal and interest were to ever not be paid, bondholders cannot come back against the city and try to get this money from your m and or, or your uh, general fund dollars. Um, the issuance of PID debt does not reduce the city's bonding capacity. However, it does count against that bank qualified debt limit that you have each year. Uh, the city, uh, like I said before, gets to keep all of its ad valorem uh, property taxes and all of its sales taxes as an additional assessment, so it is not affecting your day-to-day -day operations. Um, and then I've already touched on the administrative part, so I'll move on to the next page. Your benefits to the city. Again, we've gone over a lot of this, but this is a tool, and I'm, I apologize I keep saying it, but I want to make sure it's clear. This is a tool of, for economic development that the city has. You do not have to grant a PID. You have the ability to, but we always, uh, we represent you, the city, and we represent who you represent. We represent your residents at the end of the day. And so we want to make sure that the city is getting the best deal and is set up the best way um, over the next 30 years um, that they get a quality development in return for the PID. Um, that, um, you know, this PID, if it helps finance things quicker, and so you hopefully you get increased Avalorum values faster than what might not normally occur. And then if you do have property that's in the ETJ that you're wanting to annex, a PID is a great tool used to get uh, that property within your city limits and start collecting Ad Valorum on it. Um, one other th thing I'll kind of go over, it's not on this, uh, in this presentation, but there are a few generalities that are good to stick to when it comes to a PID. One of them is your tax stack. This is an additional assessment, like I said, and so you do not want to create an annual installment that takes you out of market out of, from competing cities. Uh, there are quite a few cities around you that do have PIDs. It is becoming a very popular tool and it's being used all across the state. But you do not want to levy an assessment that gets you out of market. So when a, if a resident was to come and they were to see the assessment, see how high it was, or if a commercial owner comes and sees how high this assessment is, if it's too high, they won't want to buy. You want to make sure you keep yourself within market. That general cap that you see in it varies depending on the area is usually a $3 tax stack. And so when you look at your city, county, ISD, any hospital districts, uh, emergency services districts, when you add in that PID annual installment equivalent tax rate, you want that to generally be about a $3 tax stack and not much higher. Uh, the other one that I'll say is when you're issuing bonds, you generally want to stay at a 3 to 1 value to lien ratio. What that means is when you have uh, land and improvements installed, so all the horizontal infrastructure is installed, there's going to be a certain value that that land is now worth. And the general best practices is that you do not issue debt that is uh, below a 3 to 1 value to lien ratio. So, for example, if you have a piece of property with the improvements installed, that would be worth $15 million. Generally, you're not going to issue a bond that is greater than $5 million. When you start to go below that 3 to 1 value to lien ratio, you start to, the, the issuance begins to be viewed a little bit more risky. Um, we deal with quite a few that go below that 3 to 1 value to lien ratio. But again, that's something just to keep in the back of your mind for consideration as we start to walk through this process and something that you'll definitely, as your financial advisor comes in, you'll want to ask those questions and you want to make sure um, that all those questions are being answered. That's something we keep our eye on as well because you want this to be marketable at the end of the day. Um, so those are the two big financial implications. Tonight, what you are looking at accepting is a PID petition to create a public improvement district and call a public hearing. You are not actually creating a PID tonight. You are merely accepting a piece of paper from the developer saying that they would like to create a PID on this piece of property, and here's what the estimated um, amount of the authorized improvements would be. 
And so you're accepting that piece of paper and you're calling a public hearing to decide if you actually want to create that PID at a later time. At that next hearing, when you hold the public hearing, if you did decide to create the PID, at that time, all you're still doing is just creating a PID. Essentially, you're drawing a boundary around a piece of land and you're saying this is a PID. You're not actually going and levying any sort of assessment at that time. There will be another council meeting where you call another public hearing and at that point, you hold that public hearing. At that point, you would actually um, consider the levy of the assessment. So we are very far, we are at the very beginning stages of this PID and the creation of it. Um, we still have very far to go. There will be quite a few documents that would be drafted and negotiations still to go through. Um, but we, this beginning, this is the very beginning stage of actually creating a PID. So no actual obligation that you are agreeing to tonight. You're merely accepting the petition. You're not agreeing to create a PID tonight. We'll hold a public hearing for that at a later date. Um, and then you are also agreeing to allow the developer to cut a check to the city to pay for the professional services to actually create this PID. So those are the main items before you tonight. Any other specific questions that I can answer right now? Yeah, council questions for Kyle? Mary? That was an excellent job of explaining. Thank you. I do have two questions. Um, one, the individuals or companies that are contemplating buying property in the pit, mm -hmm. should one exist, why are they willing to be assessed this assessment? What do they get out of it? And it's that same two words. It's but for the PID that this would not be possible. Um, if you were, and that's a, that's a great question to keep in your mind moving forward. Um, you want to get a higher quality development or you want to negotiate for something that otherwise you might not have gotten. And so the pit assessment that you placed on the land, you need to have that element of, yes, this is worth it. Something else I'll say on top of that is that that lien is placed on the piece of property. It transfers with, with ownership. So whoever owns the property owns the land. And so let's say that you do um, go and you have a residential piece of property and the assessment on that piece of property is $10,000. It's kind of like a mortgage where you have the ability to just pay it all off at once if you want. If not, you pay it off over time with principal and interest. Most residents do not live in a home for 30 years. And so normally a resident will live in a home for three to five years. And so they're not necessarily paying the full burden of that pit assessment if they do not live there that whole time. And so they might uh, move into the city if they only live here for five years or they move to another home, that uh, assessment that is outstanding will transfer to the next property owner. So you, one, you're getting higher quality development. Two, you're not necessarily going to be owning the property for the full 30 years, but there's those two words that is most important, that but for. And so you want to make sure that what you're assessing the PID for, the benefit received from that is greater than the assessment you're placing on the property. And the other question, it might be somebody on the staff because I'm going to be asking you what are the drawbacks of a PID, and you might say there are none. <laughs> so I, it sounds like there are no drawbacks. So I was just wondering, are there any and what are they? And from an objective standpoint, uh, which I, you I may not else, be able to I can do. let someone else answer, but what, what I will say is it is an assessment at the end of the day. Someone is paying for the dollars, okay. um, and so that is a drawback, mm -hmm. but the benefits far outweigh. But and to a city. To a city. What are the drawbacks? It doesn't seem like there are any. There are not a lot of drawbacks when it comes to a city because you're able to get a higher quality development. You're usually able to get it quicker. <clears throat> you have the ability to negotiate what you want in that development agreement. Uh, there are no um, dollars that are being taken out of your general fund to mm -hmm. finance this. Your current residents that are in the city today, you are not raising their taxes to pay for this PID. But what, with your one drawback is at the end of the day, the people in the PID are paying the assessment. And that's why, and it's a legislative finding that the city council will make, is that the assessment, the special benefit received, is greater than the assessment. The city council has to find that, and we, we make sure that that benefit that they're receiving is greater than uh, the assessment right. we're placing on the property. But I will let anyone else objectively <laughs> answer. Um, I would say, you know, 
Kyle's done a great job. Uh, for the record, Mayor, I believe he's an Aggie. Might be. <laughs> need I to note the that. So I'm, I'm in hiding. I, I saw the <laughs> eye contact. I am not an I don't Aggie. I'm not either. Sir. I'm sorry. I, I forgive you. Um, forgive me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now I can sleep at night. Um, you know, what it does and what in the specific context of this development is our friends at Provident, the first phase of their development will be multifamily. It will pay potentially either on a reimbursement basis or we issue bonds at some point in the future for the future extension of Western Center Boulevard, which makes the two um, tracks or parcels, about 30-some acres, round numbers, immediately developable for multifamily. Um, you know, the drawback on the city side, although we will have a third-party administrator, there's always going to be calls to the city, and there is some administrative burden for the city that will work through um, P3 as our, our contract administrator. So there's in this proposed PID, we're not talking about a residential neighborhood, so dozens of lots of single-family homes where a property owner, you know, they may not read their closing documents and call Kyle. They may not be Aggies, you know, <laughs> may have went to Texas Tech and not want to talk to an Aggie. I guarantee you they'll call the city and want to know what the answer is or uh, how it can be resolved. Uh, but, you know, generally it's it expedites what would happen maybe naturally in the market plus improve the quality of the development so this property whether it's now or at some point in the future will develop into something they're not making more land as you're aware in our almost eight square miles of uh, city limits and so this the PID would make things happen quicker and, and also to our liking some of the things that Kyle touched on mm -hmm. thank you other questions Mary, that cover all your questions? No, that's all. Okay. Mr. Tucker? Keep Mayor Protem? <laughs> hey, Mr. Honest. Farr? No, sir. Mr. Beasley? I keep hearing this higher quality development. What does that mean? Is that because of the developer agreement? Yeah, you That we would, can make the request? Or? Yeah, so the, the city is holding in its cards right now a PID, and you have the option to play that card or to not play that card. And so usually what happens is, you will enter into a development agreement with the developer. At that point, you'll be negotiating everything that is going into that development agreement. And so if you want uh, higher building standards, if you want higher open space percentages, if you want a better trail system, if you wanted a public park, if you wanted X, Y, and Z amenities, it's at that point that you are negotiating all those higher standards and then it will say in that development agreement, in return for all this, we're agreeing to Give create a PID, PID and okay. put, levy the assessment on the property. Okay. Thank you. So, Mayor, I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. that, that, if I may, that, that segues into perhaps the most important conversation tonight. The three items on the agenda are rather routine for purposes of the PID and really contain no risk for the city. Now, as Kyle said, you're just accepting a petition and ordering staff to issue notice of a public hearing for an October 20th meeting. Number two, you're approving a reimbursement professional services agreement whereby the developer has agreed to fully fund all of the city's costs associated with doing this. And number three, you're approving an engagement agreement with P3 with rather favorable terms. And I apologize, I sent it to you so late, but you may have noticed that it even says at no time will P3 ask for their services to be paid for out of the general fund and they will delay any invoices if there's any delay with respect to the, the district or the developer fronting the cost for their services. So these are all very favorable. They don't commit you to anything moving forward. Uh, the, the real issue and, and what staff and I have been working on with the developer over the last few weeks is really sort of wrestling with the idea, and, and Mr. Farr said it last time, what makes this PID worthy? Because what, what you have is we, we do not have planned development zoning on this property. We have straight zoning, which if you flip through the zoning ordinance will give you a litany of various uses that are allowed in the multifamily, light industrial, um, and the commercial areas. Uh, but you have the opportunity through a development agreement 
to exercise and exert some additional control. Now, what, what we've talked about with the developers so far is uh, extension of the overlay district use restrictions from our ordinance. It, this property is not in the overlay, but we, by contract, we can apply those to this, to this area. Uh, but as you know, those are more sort of restrictions on use rather than requirements that certain uses go in. Okay, number two, <clears throat> uh, you, may, you all may recall in the 2019 legislative session, the legislature took away our authority to require exterior building material types. Um, so th they have agreed to put that back in and essentially contractually agree to adhere to our exterior masonry standards, which frankly are, are terribly onerous, um, but of course they are now optional but for a development agreement. Mm. And so the conversation that we've been having um, over the, the, the real crux of the conversation we've been having is um, what sort of commercial and or retail deliverables do you want to require uh, that this development bring? Because, and you're not required to obligate the developer to bring these, or, or parks or open space or any of those things, but you heard Kyle's presentation about the various things that w might make this better. Um, I, I think certainly you'll get a, a, a better quality, perhaps multifamily apartment complex, but is that enough for 30 years of administrative work that the city's going to be involved in? Um, so if, if there are some deliverables that you all want to see, a sit-down restaurant, um, you know, uh, grocery or it, basically, and this is a two-way conversation, obviously. We can't dictate it, but you can certainly condition moving forward on these sorts of things. This is the feedback that staff and I are going to need because on October 20th, together with the public hearing and uh, approval of establishing the district, I would also like to have this development agreement on the agenda that talks about here are the restrictions for development and here's what's required for this development. Because the developer is asking, you saw the four types of, of PIDs that you can create. What the developer is asking for is the number three, bearer land issue debt. Um, and you, you may have noticed in the, in the PID creation petition, the ceiling that's being estimated for this property is, is $14 million on 78 acres paid out over uh, potentially 30 years. So now, while that has to still go through underwriting, bond counsel, the attorney general's office to ensure that it's it's financially viable, um, it is it is. These are going to be your future businesses, the city's future residents. So, in terms of the potential downside, as Gabe pointed out, these people are going to be calling city hall with complaints and grievances, and and you, you still want to make this area attractive in the market so that these businesses don't go to a competing neighboring city. So that did bring about a few questions for me, to, really to Bryn, and not off of this subject, off the petition subject. Is, it, is it more developer agreement questions? No, this is really okay. about the petition itself, so I think it may elicit okay. a response from sure. the ahead. presenter right now. So if we accept the petition tonight, uh, would, would that not signal at least enough agreement for the developer to start spending money? Well, I'll let the developer speak to that, but obviously that's the first in the regulatory approvals that is necessary, and I think that certainly is a sign of good faith. But again, you know, how much reliance to place on it, I'll let the developer speak to that. Now, well, the, the reason I'm asking the question to you, Brian, is that if we accept the petition, the developer begins to spend money, and somewhere along the way during negotiations, the deal falls apart. At what point would the city be liable to the, de to the developer to reimburse the developer's costs incurred after the petition was accepted? There, there's no responsibility in the reimbursement agreement to okay. reimburse funds that were paid for actual costs incurred. You'd simply be required to reimburse any amount of the escrow that wasn't expended. That was my only question related to the petition. Yeah, I, let's, let's keep this section to the, the PID itself, and we can talk development agreement later after we get through it. But thank you, Kyle. Thank Appreciate, you. That. Appreciate it. One thing to remember about Kyle and P3, they work for the city. They work for us, so that's an important note. When, 
when just discussions and how, how the situation, how the relationships are. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, we do not work for any developers. We only work for cities and municipalities and counties across the state of Texas. So you're our number one priority. Thank you, Thank Kyle. You. Appreciate Thank that. You. All right, now let's, let's bounce back to number three and the presentation by Providence. So welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, City Council members, staff. Thank you for taking all this time to come out and speak with us and ask questions. Um, in a conversation last Will you introduce week, yourself, Stuart? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart Fink with Provident Realty Advisors, Dorothy Parks uh, with Provident Realty Advisors. Thank you again for allowing us to come and talk to you. I have a presentation because, Mayor, I promised you that I would show you an example, some examples of some of the things that we've done because we've all talked about kind of highest and best use and what you can expect out there. And so if we could scroll, scroll through the retail uh, information that we have here, I can describe the projects as we go through and you guys can answer or ask any questions that you may have about those. So here is an example of four retail projects. This is down in Stafford, Texas. This is a um, dentist and an eye lab. In a, the eye lab is in a multi-tenant building. It's a single tenant building at the dentist. This is a Pluckers uh, restaurant that uh, is there at Stafford um, and an In-N-Out Burger. Um, that In-N-Out Burger does about $10 million in sales a year. But as a perspective, you know, Saginaw and its population size, I understand, is about 24, 25,000 people. Uh, Stafford is about 18,000. And so real estate's always dependent upon what's around you and how it's driven. But I wanted to give you that example. And then if we could scroll through a little bit further, this is a whiskey cake sit-down restaurant at Stafford. Um, that whiskey cake <clears throat> was in operation before the virus struck and is closed down and then reopened. And so they are actually back operating again in Stafford. Uh, Canes and then an Outback Steakhouse, all of which were uh, developed uh, there at Stafford. The next one is at Swisher uh, in Corinth, Texas. Uh, Corinth has about 21,000 people in population. This is a multi-tenant building example of some of the architecture that we developed. Um, <coughs> excuse me, you could keep going. A few more uh, pictures of the Corinth development and the multi-tenant space there. Um, discount tire, Arby's. Uh, and so we try to, everything that we do, you know, it's important that it meshes with what's around it. It's important that to the next guy it's appealing. Uh, Lazy Dog we've done at Stacy Green in Allen, Texas. Allen has about 103,000 people, so a little bit bigger. Um, uh, Mexican food restaurant, another Chipotle uh, multi-tenant building there. Um, if you could keep scrolling, that'd be great. Um, Stacy Green is one of our newer developments. Dorothy is actually very uh, integral in that development right now. More multi-tenant space there, Mod Pizza, et cetera. Um, and then <clears throat> here's one in Tyler, Texas. Uh, this is more of a big box kind of development that we did a few years ago. Um, everything I've showed you so far has been more recent. Uh, Tyler's got about 105,000 people, but multi-tenant uh, buildings and some big boxes there. Examples of architecture that we've approved in our developments. Um, if we could keep scrolling, that'd be great. <clears throat> That's it. Okay, great. The next thing I want to do is I think that the council has all been focused, maybe not focused, but certainly aware of the fact that um, the very first things that we need to do out there are the cottages and then the multifamily. And so in speaking with my platform director today, we put together some pictures of an example of something that would be applicable in Saginaw based on the rent market, rental market out here and give you an example of the three-story type of development that we would do here. He said this is a great representation of what would be typical that we would do here on the tract. He actually even has a site plan already laid out for this. Uh, we could scroll through a couple of those pictures and show the pool, single-story clubhouse with a lot of glass, all the, t the buildings there. <clears throat> but, a, you know, very typical garden-style apartment that we do uh, at Provident. Um, other than that, you know, how do we get here today? Uh, you know, we've talked about why do you need a PID, uh, what do PIDs do for you. Um, for us, as we put this piece of property under contract, we started talking to the city, and the, the very first things that came up were, hey, we're going to need some roads, we're going to need some of this done, and so we started talking about a 380 agreement. Uh, as we went through the due diligence process, we came to the realization that instead of maybe two or three or four million dollars in infrastructure, the price for the things that were needed was going to be closer to 11 or 12 million dollars. And so as a result, you know, that's a big ticket item for anybody to write a check for. And so 
knowing my background, we went and started talking about the PID and how do we get this financed to actually get to a place to where we can do this. Because as I've said before, for a developer, the length of time is it kills your transaction. It just makes it not workable. And so to compress things and make them work faster gets development up quicker, creates tax base quicker, makes everything work for the, you know, the good of everybody involved, really. And so the PID came into the conversation. I also want to address any concerns the city may have about being rushed, if you will. Uh, certainly not our intent, but once we found out that, oh gosh, you're looking at almost $12 million before parks, before open space, which is how we got to 14 in the petition, um, we wanted to be sure that you guys were aware that once we got in and figured out how much it was going to cost, we really needed to go this route. And so with a PID and then a PID bond, again, it allows us to finance up front, put those streets and roads and curbs and gutters and sidewalks in place so that the developers can get there. Because um, no one's going to come and, and, and put down a restaurant or put down a multifamily complex without a road. And so to your question, why do you need a PID? And to that business owner, you know, the simplistic answer is simply, that's how you got your road to get to, get your, to, to your property. Um, but I don't want to oversimplify things. Um, it is a great tool. Um, we like to use it. We think it's good for the city. It's good for us. Um, and we'd love to field any questions you guys may have about Provident or our intentions out there on the 70 acres. Council questions? Yes, Mary. Um, Brian will, will probably be able to answer part of this, if not all of it. And I did come with a wish list. Okay. And what I want to know is that's going to be a negotiation first among the city council. What is the city council's wish list? Not what is Mary's. So we have to have time to decide that. And I just wonder how much time we have in when do we have to say, okay, here's what we want? When do we have to give you that? Well, we have one additional regular scheduled meeting before October 20th. I don't anticipate the development agreement to be a very overly sophisticated document because it's just going to focus on commercial and retail sort of items. Um, you don't have to come to consensus tonight on exactly what you'd like. Um, we can either hold another special called meeting, but, uh, or, or we receive feedback at the next meeting in October. I would like to have all of that resolved prior to the October 20th meeting, because if we can't come to terms on that, I don't see the point in creating the PID, because in order to undo the PID, we need a fully executed petition from the current property owner and the two trusts that own the property asking for it to be dissolved um, because otherwise you have a PID district out there that serves no purpose. So ideally by the October 20th meeting we'll have a several page development agreement that just talks about the, the, the deliverables, commercial mm -hmm. retail or parks or mm -hmm. whatever you all would like if you would like anything. Um, but that that's the goal so I think it would be a good idea for me to at least express what I have in mind and and then that would be like a starting point that'd be great um, the other thing I would offer too is um, we're in the market every day if you will on all of our projects and so we have brokers engaged going out to look for people to come and you know take our land from us in terms of developing things there whether it's a restaurant or an office building or whatever the case may be and so I would just offer up to the council and the mayor that if you would like to see some of the research that we have access to it might give you a great foundation for what's possible mm -hmm. if you will because we're obviously constrained with what's possible who's willing to come and buy this dirt and build a fill in the blank right and so um, we have that data we have people that are professionals that are out looking for people all the time to come and, and develop on our property and so um, offer that up to y'all as a completely, you know, open transaction for you to, to have access to. So, and, and I'm coming from a, in a perfect world. And if all I would have to do would snap my fingers and you would do this. So I understand, A, everybody might not even want this on the council. And I doubt 
we could have all of these things. But not to interrupt you, so I apologize. Oh, Dorothy Parks with Provident Realty. Uh, we have already agreed to kind of a list of things, and so if it would be helpful, I can go through that yes. list already, and then some of those things might have already been yes, addressed. Yes, that would be good. Good idea, Dorothy. Thank you. Gabe, I sent you. An, okay, you have it. Okay, perfect. I didn't, wasn't sure I got it to you in time, so I also printed out a bunch of copies. That's it. Dorothy, we have we've got yes. copies. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So. And I apologize. They don't they don't make these for short people, so I apologize. Okay. okay so. I named it, I called it the overlay district on here. I don't know if we're really calling it an overlay district since it's in a development agreement, but for, for the purposes of this. Sure. Um, so we have already uh, agreed to a couple of things. They have not been incorporated into the, oh, thank you, into the site plan yet. So I apologize that I don't have sort of a site plan that shows all of this, but I certainly uh, can get you one as we develop it. And then obviously by October 20th, we'll have something better for you to show, to see. Uh, so a dedicated public space area, um, we've had lots of discussions on whether that is or both a, just a, you know, a dog park that services the, the residential plus a play area, what that play area looks like. Um, some suggestions have been splash pads and things like that, so we haven't quite defined what that is yet, but there is definitely going to be a dedicated open space area, public space area. Uh, we are looking and talking to all of the, the uh, residential about pedestrian connectivity throughout the development uh, so that the sidewalks will flow into all of the different elements, and so you know, someone can easily walk from their apartment over to some of the retail and things like that. Um, we're going to have amenities along the pedestrian trail, so park benches, um, you know, possibly some lower pedestrian lighting, uh, trash receptacles, obviously, to keep it clean as you go and get your, your food to go and walk back. You're not throwing, you have a place to throw it. Um, screening on the rooftop uh, mechanical units, um, that will be required as part of the development agreement. Uh, as you, want, our, you want to forward through so we can all see the... Oh, there you sorry go. about that. All right. Uh, the, uh, as Brent already said, the commercial buildings would be 75% masonry. Um, no pylon or pole-mounted signs, only uh, monument signs for all the, the users. Uh, we'll prohibit backlit wall signs, which was also part of the overlay, so we just carried that over. Um, we'll limit window signs and decals. Um, obviously, you know, all the retailers want to have their social media and website up on their um, doors and hours, but as far as, you know, a bunch of coming soon and, and all that other business, we will limit that. Uh, we'll prohibit on the commercial track um, auto sales, mini warehouses, payday lenders, and equipment rentals, um, which is also a carryover from uh, the overlay car washes would be allowed only by SUP, which would be something that we'd have to come back to to um, ask ask for. Uh, and then, as far as convenience stores, we would limit it to one uh, only on the entirety of the commercial track. Um, something that I really hadn't discussed with Bryn, so I'm going to spring it on and Gabe, spring it on now. We would ask that that also be limited if there's a larger user. Um, that has fuel as an accessory use, um, a la Rudy's or a grocer, we would ask that we would be able to, to accommodate that as well. Um, on the setbacks, so with the overlay district, uh, the setbacks there, um, they pushed all the buildings up into the, um, the road. And I just wanted to make clear that that was something that we were trying to stay consistent with the commercial zoning and our current setbacks. Um, part of the reason for that is because we're trying to stay, um, again, we're walking that line between being competitive with everybody else and then also making sure that we have a nice development, right? And so um, if we're telling the commercial users and especially the national users that, hey, you have to do 75% masonry when you didn't have to before, and you have to use these special light poles that you didn't have to before, and oh, by the way, you have to change your entire footprint because you have to do these building setbacks that you didn't have before. It's, it's getting pretty tricky for, um, for us to, to get those desired users here. 
Uh, we also will prohibit chain link and vinyl slats for the trash enclosures. Um, we'll comply with the 15-foot landscape edge requirement. And uh, we'll specify a consist consistent light pole throughout the development. So um, I can't, multifamily has a different height of, develop, of pole than they do for residential and retail, um, but we'll, we'll have the same light fixture or be in the same you know, light family. So hopefully that answers some of your questions. I also wanted to uh, say that we also have our broker here tonight um, who has uh, been the one that has negotiated um, with Ms. White um, on, on all of our uh, behalves. And then also he's been the one who has reached out to a lot of the uh, commercial users, a lot of the restaurants. And so any insight or questions that you have about that, he's here to address those as well. Okay. Mary, you still have some questions? Okay. Um, I, we had some emails that we got with different suggestions, and one that stuck out at me as a good suggestion is a mural wall. I think that would be great. Sure. That was a suggestion from some of you. Okay. And maybe maybe some, maybe some a sculpture, uh, maybe a gazebo with a seating area somewhere in there, and maybe use of awnings. These are just all things that pretty things up. Sure. And um, some of the uses that I thought might be appropriate is very much a feminine wish list. <laughs> <laughs> I admit that. A yoga studio, a boutique, a gift shop, a bakery. I think everybody would love a bakery. No, not a donut shop. Um, a tea room and just unique shops, one of a kind. <clears throat> we like the mom and pops, but I know those are hard to get started too. So if you get a like a whiskey cake, I think, and if it was uh, you know was successful, then I think you could attract some of these smaller that would be able to survive because of the traffic. From the from the uh, uses that are very successful already. Sure. And I did like that architecture from like the whiskey cake, and I very much do not like the one wall of everything attached in a straight line. Even if they have different face fronts, mm -hmm. I think that's a tired look. I think it's overdone and I think you see it everywhere and the more we could have detached uses but I saw one with three attached that was pretty that was fine you know that wasn't bad sure but just that whole wall of yeah that doesn't appeal to me at all and then the landscaping do you typically use uh, native Texas plants we, well, it depends on the city ordinance, and so usually, and I think here included, but I don't want to speak out of turn, there's a plant list that we're supposed to kind of pick off of, and so we would follow that. Just whatever our... Correct. And... So I will say, you know, we have different types of retail standalone retail, which is on their own pad, which is generally like a restaurant that just stands alone. And then we have inline retail, um, which is more of the, the type of building that you were talking mm -hmm. about. And so we can definitely work on those. Um, I will say most of these uses go in the inline. Um, you know, we don't have, usually have a standalone yoga um, or anything, but so we'll have to just work through, you know. And like I said, it's, it's in a perfect world. Sure. And, um, I'll think of it in a minute. I okay. forgot what I was well, going to say. We're here. We're not going anywhere. So, <laughs> so that's it. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I just want to, uh, Stuart had mentioned a couple of developments in other cities. Uh, I want to draw your attention back to, you'll, you'll remember Aaron Farmer. So Keith and I um, are talking with Aaron to try to encourage, you know, stay in contact with retailers and, and uh, make sure our market data is made aware to brokers and such. 
So we put this together, and I was reading it. I apologize. I should have uh, committed this to memory at this point. Uh, but if memory serves me right, our trade area, our population is 25,000 and change. Our two-mile trade area, I think, is about 60,000. Um, you extend that out to five miles, and you start hitting Fort Worth in all directions. There's a lot of people. So while we are 25,000, there's a lot of folks that are really close, uh, which is, if Brent and I have expressed this to our friends at Provident, you know, this is probably one of the most developable tracks or is the most developable track left in the, the city. So um, we did our eat and play survey, right? So uh, I'm not going to tell Provident that, you know, all the things that residents told us they want are realistic or, or feasible. So on the retail side, number one was a target. Um, I'm pretty confident we're not going to get a target because there's one, you know, at uh, Presidio. Uh, restaurants, oddly enough, number one was uh, Chili's Grill and Bar. I was young enough to memorize the catchy Baby Back Rib song. It's still stuck in my mind. So bring a Chili's, we're I, all I happy. I worked there through college, so I can, I can recite the several, seven steps sure. of civil service still. So that, I, I just want to draw your attention back to that. Um, we've talked about some of the nice-to-haves, and you know, ultimately it becomes to what's uh, realistic. We, we've mentioned this to Provident. You know, nobody would reasonably expect a, you know, a, a five-star restaurant that would be in um, the dark regions of downtown Dallas. Uh, I, I try not to go to Dallas. I prefer Tarrant County. But we're very reasonable people. Uh, but now's the time, to Bryn's point, to let them know, you know, we can't pick off a menu of, oh, I like that restaurant or that, but... We need to give them direction of what's tolerable and what's not, or expected and what's not. And as I hear some of this and think about this, this might be a time for us to uh, recess to executive session to talk about a couple of these things. We, we mentioned that as an option. Um, if the council would prefer that, or would the council prefer to keep discussing this in open session, some specifics and come back maybe with a more unified list? What do you all think? So just before we go into executive session, I'd like to get some global understanding, sure. the, bigger, the bigger moving parts, before we kind of drill down onto yoga and things of that nature. Sure. So uh, what is the total acreage? I'm hearing 70, 75. What's the total acreage? Somebody have that in from 78 acres? Yeah, 78.72. Yeah, I didn't have that. Yeah. And then I'm hearing that there is a site plan that's in circulation and folks are talking about that site plan. And I don't know that I've seen it personally. Uh, the site plan the site plan that we have is the site plan that was presented during zoning. Um, I have a copy of it if you want it, but it's not, uh, let's see, it's, it's from April. Okay. We haven't updated it since then. Uh, our current, we're currently updating it so we can add in this pedestrian area, we can add in um, the park area, we're refining uh, how much detention we actually need, and okay. then, so, so that's the only site plan I have. No, no, that's it. that's okay. I just okay. wanted to, I wanted to know that you guys are far enough along to answer the rest of these these general questions. Sure. So what is basically the rough acreage of public improvements, meaning the hard road surfaces and public right-of-way? Do you have a rough idea of what that acreage is out of the 78? I do, but I don't have it with me. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I believe it's around seven acres. Okay. That's, that's close enough. Yeah, I think off the top of my head, I think Western Center and right away dedication was five of that. So balance I, I just, of two acres. And I'm not holding you to this. I'm, okay. I just I want to have it in my head what the general makeup of the development is. So uh, in in terms of multifamily, and I'm not talking about the high density single family development, but the multifamily mm -hmm. in particular, how many acres of multifamily? That's 18, 17.9. Okay. And then the high density single family units, the cottages, how many acres? 21. Okay. And those are individual, sold as individuals or are they sold as duplexes and, and fourplexes? 
No, so there are cottages for rent. So one okay. owner Got will it. have those cottages. Okay. And then. Um, so it's investment property. It's it's. Got well, it. No. It's, it's, I mean, not, it's, a, it's not for somebody to buy and they own it. It's investment property. One, I understand it's one taxpayer. So you talk about phone calls? Yes, absolutely. You, it, you, I don't want to see more than five owners out here, quite frankly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just wanting to warm myself to the, whole, the global thing here. Now, public use areas that you were just talking about, mm -hmm. about how many acres of public use are you thinking? Well, we haven't developed the site plan yet, so, but I'm thinking that if we're including the detention, which will be used, can be used as like a dog park and things like that whenever it's not obviously being used as detention. Inundated? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're about five to six acres. Okay, five to six. I'm just going to say five on the low side. And then commercial acres. The commercial acreage is, well, of course, it's not totaled in here for me. I'd have to do the math. It's 78 minus 21 minus uh, 18. Somewhere around there. Oh, minus five and then five. seven. And the seven, yeah. So whatever that math is. I'm not doing it in my head. Okay, good. I still have a little bit of COVID head, so. <laughs> well, I could do it in my head, but it would be wrong. So. Uh, how much was it? All right, 78. I'm just going to say minus seven, minus 18, minus 21. Minus five. Minus five. 27. So roughly 27 acres of commercial. Now, I want to clarify that. The 18 and 21, does that include parking for the multifamily and parking for, okay. And 27 would also include parking for all commercial and circulation drives. Correct. Okay. All right, so at the end of the day, we're, we're the, these are the metrics that are going to be important in the back of my head because it's a 78-acre, as you heard the city manager say, it's our eastern gateway into the city, okay? And it's our last really good opportunity to develop something there. So as long as I know that these metrics are, are pretty solid, I, I mean, 27 acres out of 78 is a pretty sizable commitment for commercial development. And, and I, I mean, I'll tell you that I appreciate that as long as we can hold to that metric. And I think as long as we're also applying our overlay rules, both in, to Mary's point, articulation is an overlay rule. Is that correct? Uh, building materials and uses being applied. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot that we have to work with here as a city council. I think we've got a lot to work with. I think where we need to be cautious, and this is just an opinion, is if these metrics start to change significantly. If we start seeing gross reductions in commercial, we start seeing reductions in our public use areas and things of that nature. So, well, and so to do that, we'd have to come back for a zoning change. Um, so there's control that the city council already has over what uses we can have and what can't what we can't well, I think do once already. once we we're, that's if we do a 380 okay what what we're thinking about right now is is anywhere between a 380 and a plan development and, and entering into a development agreement with you okay right. that's where we left off in the last meeting and i do want to just i'm not trying to throw a wrench in things but i do want to make clear that we have to have the ability to sell some of these pads within the retail that's what the market is demanding now. They all want to own their own real estate. They understand how valuable real estate is. And so um, I wanted to just make sure that we're clear in that retail development area, it's not going to be all one owner. And I think in a development agreement, we can probably stipulate conveyance rules. Okay. Who you can convey that to and who you can't. Okay. But, I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud about what okay. options would, would exist in a development agreement versus a reimbursement or performance-based 380.
Well, it, and a development agreement is a contract. So yep. whatever terms that the parties can agree on are fair game. And, and quite frankly, I understand it needs to be equitable. You need to be able to do what you need to do to make this work. And, and I don't think anybody on the council is, is wanting to create an unusable condition here. I think what we do want to create is some strong understanding of what you're going to be doing. And I'll use the phrase, but for, okay? Sure. Here, I'm going to use the phrase, but for, in the context of the entire city's development. But for these agreements that we've already reached with developers north of Walmart, we now have 250 units of high-density housing going in there. We have another developer coming next month to pitch 1,000 units, okay? And there will be some but fours in there. We have already done but fours on just north of where you're developing on another apartment complex. And I will tell you that five years ago, if you walked in this room and uttered the words apartment complex, you would not be allowed to stay in the room. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot, there's a lot of, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of but for here that is accommodating multifamily that in the city of Saginaw has been a very ugly word for a very long time. So we have got to show our constituents, we've got to show the taxpayers, we've got to show the community that not, we are not but foring the opportunity for somebody to just come in and develop apartments all over our city. Sure. We are but foring the opportunity to better develop a mixed use type of environment that includes multifamily that feeds into the revenue streams of commercial development. Well, another but for would be, but not for the multifamily, we couldn't have the commercial. I mean, the, that multifamily, you know, it's 700 bodies at full development for the multifamily, another 440 for the cottages. That is what's going to necessitate the commercial. It, and without those, we won't be able to have a, a, a commercial project. Exactly. And, and I think that's what we all have to know that we're trading on here. We all, as a group, need to be able to go out to the community and say, no, we didn't just accept something to go build a bunch of apartments. I, I mean, that would be hard for me to survive, quite frankly. So what you're saying is about 1,100 something families that's going to be there? In that Not 1,100 families, 1,100 people, oh, okay. individuals. I mean, mm -hmm. people. Okay. okay. One thing we didn't mention, um, the light industrial, what, how big a piece is that? Seven acres. So of that, of that 27 commercial, seven is light industrial, correct? You're correct. Okay. And if we do some kind of, of development agreement, would it not make sense for us to just move this into a, a, a public, some kind of development rather than uh, just reevaluate the zoning that we have out there. Do we have to be so rigid as to keep our zoning requirements? So the, the zoning just entitles the property. If you want to obligate a deliverable that needs to be in a development agreement, it, you cannot dictate that something has to come. It, now, it, it, the PD zoning is going to work like a 380 agreement. If you want to bring it, the zoning will allow it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be mandatory. A 380 agreement, if you want to bring it, you'll receive an incentive. It's not going to be mandatory. The development agreement is going to be mandatory, and the, usually the way a development agreement works is it deals with the issuance of building permits and phasing. So you entitle all of the residential up front, and then you say, for instance, uh, your, your, the first building permit issued for commercial use has to be a sit-down restaurant and we won't issue any other permits for the entire commercial piece mm -hmm. until you bring a sit-down restaurant. That's just an example. Understood. Okay? But that, that, that's how you incentivize and somewhat require something sure. to be brought. Otherwise, if you just approve zoning, even if you have all the restrictions, it's, you know, in this area it has to be this, or you have to seek a rezoning for that area. But you usually don't go to that level of detail uh, that the, the development agreement can afford us with. The only reason I'm suggesting this is, as an option or a tool to us is that once Western Center is built out, the configuration 
of the development overall uh, may lend itself to where commercial on either side of the road may work out better rather than consolidated to one side of the road. I mean, it, there, there are opportunities that that might give us to maximize those commercial use opportunities. By then, that we'll have already transferred ownership, so the multifamily will, will be locked into play and the single uh, cottages will be locked into play. So essentially what you're communicating is the rush here is you have a buyer. No, the rush is that we have a seller and we are obligated to close on a certain time frame. But, and but what you communicated to me that the opportunities after we've agreed to put this pit in place to configure the development such that it maximizes commercial opportunity, not necessarily multifamily opportunity, is that you already have a multifamily buyer. Well, the site plan has already been configured to maximize the commercial opportunity right there along um, 156 and along the, the major thoroughfares. So that's where we would traditionally put our, our commercial anyway. That's where the commercial retailers want to go. So was it... Was it placed there, or is that where it resides when the road is put in place and the zoning that's already there in place is applied? We put it there, and then we had a zoning case come in, and we put the zoning in the place that we wanted it that maximized the commercial opportunity. Okay. So we had a site plan first, and then we came in for zoning. Okay. So, yeah, Mr. Mr. Mayor did address the point. Uh, I will say in my time here, three years in January, there's been a number of people, larger groups that have approached the property owner. No one has gotten this far. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already proceeded to zoning entitlement. So mm -hmm. that's a significant undertaking that's, that's occurred. Um, the commitments for the, the multifamily and the one, um, I think they call it a single family home for rent or, or cottage type development is very, very nice. I believe that Provident has an LOI from a group that's willing to take that down as soon as they purchase the property and own it. And as soon as Western center is built, which gives it public access to be able to be developed. Uh, it is very nice. It's also, um, not terribly dense. So that's good. Um, what are the units per acre? <sighs> Do you know? By the time you park it, I think it was about 12. I think it's 12. Yeah, I think it's 12 because what it is is if you, and this is the best example we have in the city. If you think of Mariposa, the cottage style, so imagine those a little bit bigger with common community amenities but kind of on its own. It's it's kind of like a, a, a cluster. Uh, it's kind of like a small neighborhood, just self-contained. Uh, that is with Stuart mentioned with one property owner, which is great. Um, you said with amenities, with amenities, yeah. So we'll I have think a clubhouse, clubhouse, we'll clubhouse on-site management. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the rim. My husband did a job at the rim, and it's like that. It's got um, commercial there, and they've got multifamily, and then they've got. It's a really nice area. Very, very nice. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, just so that I understand right. the timing. Uh, so the, the current configuration as it's zoned today was adopted after you guys brought a zoning case. Correct. Okay. I'm, I'm remembering now, this has been, it's been a year or a long, something. Long it's been a long time. It was June. It was, it was during COVID. I had a, I had a. Goodness gracious. Well, the, so the, the property was already, already had existing multifamily zoning. Provident requested that it be on, um, that it be zoned up to accommodate the density because the reality is by the time you park, you know, have parking and common space, open space, you can't get the number of units per acre. Okay. So, yeah. I, you know, I think I, that's a good point. The mayor pro tem, I believe be the case. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, this this COVID situation has kind of messed up everybody. <laughs> right, it sure has. And, and quite frankly, these are really the only big picture questions that I've had. So I appreciate you answering sure. them as succinctly as. So, so one thing you mentioned, and I want to make sure 
the multifamily, you're doing in in house private multifamily. That's your that's your buyer. It, it's yourself, right? Correct. Okay, that's what. So, I and I might ask the multifamily y'all are going to do, but the ho single family home for rent will be parceled Third out. Party. Yes. Okay. And is that um, concurrent? Both projects will be. That's what I figured. Correct. In fact, I have a bit of a timeline. If you want to yeah. just go through that, that'll. Oh, that'd be great. Sure. I appreciate that you guys are here on a day when you shouldn't be here, so I'll try to make it super quick. Um, We're not missing a stars game, so it's okay. <laughs> well, it was a hard game last night. Um, <laughs> so what we're anticipating is that uh, we would be able to get our plan approval. Um, oh, Rick's not here tonight, but we have to get go through TxDOT, obviously, um, to get our approval with Western Center since it ties into TxDOT Road. Um, so we likely wouldn't be able to get our plan approval until uh, mid-February. And then we would go out to bid and start construction. We are anticipating that we could be able to deliver uh, to the multifamily in about six months. We will not be completed until probably eight uh, or maybe nine months um, just to do that tie-in into the light and, and all of that with TxDOT. But we at least have it rough graded and have access in a way that they can start. Uh, the multifamily is looking at starting um, around November of next year, and then they would be complete in November of the following year uh, and open for leasing. They would not lease up and be, you know, reach full lease up until uh, May of 2023. The cottages are looking to start construction in January of 2022. They will be complete and open for leasing in uh, August of 2022, but they won't reach full lease out until August of 2023. So that, that number of 700 bodies and 440 bodies, it really won't be until third quarter of 2023 that it's fully leased out. So just on the multifamily and the cottages, what is the total anticipated valuation? Uh, I tried to get that from them today, and I could not. Uh, we're looking at around some, somewhere around $16 million. Okay. So using the three-to-one uh, ratio on $14 million, that gets us to 46 million total. Will all of this land value at 46 million? We'll have to, I mean, I don't have that information in front of me, but I'll certainly, that's for our underwriters to. Yeah, so, so that's one thing we'll, we'll visit with, with Stuart and with P3. It's, it all has to, Dorothy mentioned, there's no, they're not gonna issue debt if it doesn't pass underwriting, but we're not gonna bring anything forward with our friends at P3 if it doesn't shake out. So uh, we don't, Brent and I haven't seen any pro formas to date, but that's forthcoming. Kyle, I'll talk about the, that process real quick, since you're here. So. And I appreciate, appreciate you staying. Of course. Uh, so if we do move forward with the process, you, you will enter into an agreement with an underwriter. Um, usually that in the market is FMS bonds. They do the majority of PID bonds in the state of Texas. Um, they will uh, hire an appraiser to go out and actually appraise the property considering the improvements that will also be done and they'll come up with an appraisal amount. Again, that appraisal is paid for by the developer. They're the ones that will cut the check for that. So we'll go through that appraisal amount. When we have that, then we'll be able to determine what that value to lien ratio is. Um, there are ways to work with it at that time and that's something that will definitely point you to your financial advisor. Um, but again, we do see across the state of Texas, there are multiple PIDs that will go to a two to one value to lien to ratio. Um, that's very low. We see two and a half, 2.75 quite a few times. Um, you also have the ability to do restricted funds. And so sometimes you will issue $15 million, but you will restrict 5 million of those dollars until they reach a certain value or until they issue a certain number of certificate of occupancies, things like that. And so as we get along further down that process, we'll be able to speak more to that, um, that specific process kind of as we go through it. But we won't, we won't move forward and we won't levy any sort of assessment. 
without that knowledge, that's something we're doing on the front end. Um, that's not something that's coming and biting us in the rear uh, after you've already moved forward with these steps. What triggered the question is the timeline, because if if number three, I think that you guys are wanting us to fund everything up front. Is that what I'm understanding? That was option three on PID? It, Right now, they are the ones burdening the cost. They're entering into that PSA tonight to pay for these costs. Any engineering costs that they're doing right now, they're already paying for that themselves. It's just that when we got to that point of actually issuing bonds, they that money would go into the trust estate, like he said, but any funds that had been spent to date, he would be able to seek reimbursement for those immediately. Okay, and that's – so if the developer is asking that bonds be sold – and cash be available in a trust account in the amount of $14 million, okay, Potentially. Mm -hmm. by February, all right, that's like right around the corner. There is a lot of stuff that has to be done between now and February to start work. And what you typically run into uh, when you're doing this a project like this with all the bond documents that you'll go through will enter into reimbursement agreements, and you have to draft preliminary limited offering memorandums, uh, indentures, continuing disclosure agreements, all of those documents will have to begin going through that preparation process along with our service and assessment plan. That's typically from uh, where we're kind of at tonight where, where you're accepting a petition to actually creating the PID and getting through to that actual bond issuance and closing is typically a three-month process. So of the what I would call marketable acreage, you have 27 acres of marketable acreage commercial. You have roughly 40 acres of marketable multifamily and high-density housing. Uh, you've got roughly 60% mm, of that sold of the marketable acreage, whether it be to yourself or to the third party. And you think that the sell value of what you already have sold is only $16 million. So what, what's going through my mind right now is how in the world are we going to justify $14 million cash in the bank on a $16 million valuation and the dirt for the commercial property has not yet been sold? Mm -hmm. I can't go put five bucks in effect a tax rate mm -hmm. on something that Applebee's may want to own, right? They'll never buy that piece of dirt. So I have to know that's a constraint. Right. I also have to know the value of the dirt, the amount of the infrastructure improvements are a value constraint. So all those things go into the mix. And preliminarily, having these two entities run the numbers, they're comfortable if we can get to you know, a number that's close enough to the Yeah, so Stuart, what's, what's resonating in my mind right now is 
I did hear you say that you were counting on about $12 million in hard cost for infrastructure. And then I heard that you had added a couple of million dollars to get to $14 million for our public use areas, parks, and so on and so forth. But what I'm getting at is if, if this valuation comes back and we do apply the three to one and we only get $7 million out of the deal, what's the first domino to fall on your side that wouldn't be paid for? Okay. So if it doesn't, if our side doesn't pencil, then this, your side can't pencil. Yeah. Understood. All right. Thank you very much. So you've got a couple years of payments escrowed to, right, in the, the bid. So that, that's part of it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. Sorry for those last okay. tack on questions. Okay. Uh, yes, Mary. And very briefly, I just thought of what I was going to say before. Uh, back to the specific wish list. We've all talked about uh, great to have an entertainment venue. And, of course, a sit-down restaurant, at least one. And then a fast casual would be good, like Panera Bread. And um, I saw in the handout, in and out we don't really want any more fast food, but I wouldn't mind an in and out you know? We don't have one of those very close. And they're very popular. Lake Worth does have one? Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> but, you know... I wouldn't be totally opposed to that. So. Uh, to speak on some of that, we've got Brian Jordan, who has been marketing the site for us, so he can give you some insight on to market trends and things like that now. Uh, you know, and I, I had to bring bullet points because I'm not smart enough to talk off the whim. Um, but we've been working on the site for a while. I'll introduce myself. I'm Ryan Jordan. Avid Could Real you approach the microphone just so we can hear you? Ryan Jordan, Avid Real Estate Advisor, 6301 Gaston Avenue, Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Um, anyway, so like what you said, I'm the broker. Uh, my background is in retail real estate. Uh, I've worked with national companies doing tenant representation uh, to small ground up retail leasing. Um, to we've, we've found ourselves focusing on um, land development projects like this quite a bit recently. Um, and actually, as I was kind of thinking about that to this evening, I, I pulled out the list of everybody we've talked to over the last year and a half. <laughs> um, and it was well over 200 folks that we've been in touch with in some type of capacity. And those 200 folks are just voids, right? So to be honest with you, I mean, there's, I know you all specifically mentioned Chili's. There's Chili's at 35 in Western Center, so they, they don't see this as a void. But so we don't, anyways. Um, Avoid is uh, usually retailers say, hey, we're not going to build, uh, depending on demographics, we're not going to build stores within three to five mile radius of existing locations. Um, so again, to your point, I mean, we've talked to full service restaurants, um, we've talked to fast casual restaurants, fast food restaurants or QSRs, um, we've talked to, we've had in-person meetings with grocery stores, um, and we've talked to several of the um, entertainment Folks, you know, there's the uh, uh, bowling and movie theater arcade combos to uh, trampoline parks like Altitude, uh, Altitude and Urban Air, and um, Urban Air just landed at Alliance. But um, all that says, I mean, I still think there's there's a lot of positives here. I mean, we're y'all's city is going through tremendous growth, and it's been a lot of fun to uh, be able to. Being commercial real estate, even in 2020, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, dot on a map, y'all are in a great position right now with this site to succeed. Providence in a great position with this piece of property to succeed. Um, and I, I want to recognize that um, y'all have a desire to obviously steward the growth that's 
that's going on in, in Saginaw, and that's certainly respectable. Um, and another positive I want to share is, I mean, we, we, we certainly share a common goal, and that's, the, at least I do, I'm standing up here just to talk about exclusively retail, um, and that's to bring quality retail to the, to the Saginaw side of 156 here. Like you said, it sells, it sells Eastern Gateway to the city, um, and we um, hopefully by talking about this ridiculous list we have, we've proven that we're, we're doing everything we can to try to meet those goals. Um, the harder part of this thing is we, we need to figure out how to activate the site, right? Um, we need to show retailers that, we're, that the property is essentially open for business, quote unquote. Because uh, as of late, our pitch is, is, um, is it's a little tougher to prove given there's just some unknowns, right? And we don't have to, retail's in a weird place. We don't need to talk about the virus. I think this conversation goes outside of the virus. Um, obviously, it doesn't help. So, you know, y'all can save that for when you go home and turn on the news or whatever. Um, and that's no fun either. Um, but I wanted to get, shed some light on the most common questions um, that, that we get on, again, any project, and especially one of the size is, kind of what and when, uh, what's the timing, and, um, or I'm sorry, what's the del what are the deliverables, when is the timing, and I actually pulled a direct quote from an email from Studio Movie Grill, because uh, obviously that would hopefully qualify as an entertainment use, and um, literally they said, what is the timing on possession and opening here, question mark. Uh, and we were able to at least give them a, an answer that was good enough to get them to study the site. Ultimately, unfortunately, they came back and said, demos are not a fit per the forecasting team. You know, obviously that was just a snip of a quote, but with uh, Sprouts, we've met with Sprouts, they kind of gave us a, a, a similar answer. They said demographics and population density are light. Um, we've met in person with Safeway, who owns Tom Thumb, uh, Market Street, uh, yeah. And uh, again, there a lot of these guys' concerns are are kind of in a general sense demographics mm -hmm. and, and uh, density. So um, so that that's one issue we've kind of found, and I think there's an immediate solution here, um, and also delivery of delivery of the actual land to these to these retail users. Uh, most of the tenants and retailers, they're in the retail business. They're not in the real estate business. So they want the path of least resistance to opening a store. Um, that, you know, that we say pad ready delivery, you know, that just means there's a solution for infrastructure um, in place for them to build a store on, right? Um, and, and, it, and to be able to confidently give them timing expectations on, uh, hey, you should be able to open within X amount of days because here's what's already gone on and here's what's there and you can go build your store. Um, so be able to confidently answer that because they've got, they've got growth strategies that are, again, this goes back to the, the tenant rep side of some of our business. Um, they, they've, got allocate, they've got their funds already allocated for the next two years um, and they've got a pipeline they've got to manage and not to mention, and we're talking about some of the, the bigger guys, right, but then the local guys will often follow, uh, is that they've got to maintain credibil credibility to their, to their boards or investment committee or real estate committees. Um, so I just, all that goes to say, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, from my experience, it's really hard to get quality retailers to come pay attention um, to something where they're not sure if it's, quote unquote real, just to kind of be a little more blunt. Um, so to, to be able to confidently answer when's the site going to be ready, what's going to be there without the risk of someone looking at, oh, you know, Ryan Jordan's a liar and he told me this four times ago, you know. So it um, doesn't make anybody look good. But luckily, like I mentioned, I mean, I think where you all are on a dot on the map and the growth of Saginaw, um, in y'all's assistance thus far with, with help, you know, we've got really good zoning to go to put a plan together here, um, and Providence 
best in the business on making magic happen and putting these things together, I, I do truly feel like there's a there's a plan in hand and a logical one to succeed and to meet the common goal, which is to bring, again, maybe selfishly for me, uh, to bring quality retail to, to the West Side 126. Um, and that's, that's really all I got, but I do appreciate you guys, and I appreciate the opportunity to do business in Zaginaw, so happy to answer questions. Any questions for Ryan? Cindy? What sort of luck have you had with HEB? That's what I hear from just about every person I talk to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, well, I specifically talked to them. Um, you know, they own, the, they own the corner of uh, Bailey Boswell and Boat Club. Yes. We put this in front of them multiple times. Um, and we just we just haven't been able to get them to buy it. We're not even looking for an H E B plus, even like it like the small mart. Yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, so, a little mini H E B, just something. It, I mean, we can we can keep swinging away, but we, we do have a relationship over there and, and yeah. we'll we're see. Texas for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> right. Other questions for Ryan? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, I do have one more. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, another thing that uh, several citizens have asked for is a decent dry cleaning service here in town. I don't know if your spaces or pad sites are designed for that type of. Uh, yeah, I, think, I don't know what sizes you're looking at. Yeah, uh, those type of users are um, what we call service retail. I usually are going in a in a strip center, um, and uh, again, I mean we. Those are dry cleaning deals, just the way the world has changed, are hard to come across these days. But um, that's kind of something that, again, comes with, with warm bodies and um, a development ready site for, for retail. Are we raising shirts, right? Are we raising shorts? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boxer shorts. All right, thank you. All right, so, Council, we've got a couple of decisions to make. Um, that was That concluded number three, so we've concluded three and four. Uh, do we want to go ahead and take action on number five, or would you like to take a few minutes to talk to our attorney and city manager in the executive session? I am comfortable moving forward with number five, if the rest of the council is, uh, as this does not obligate us to any more steps than, than what we do tonight. There's still many steps to go. How does the rest of the council feel? Let's move forward. You good? <laughs> Mr. Beasley, good. I'm good. Uh, then, moving forward to item number five, I'll, I'll accept an action regarding resolution of City Council to accept the petition to create Western Center Public Improvement District on property consisting of uh, 78 acres, etc., as described. Uh, any questions, comments? If not, I will entertain a motion. I move we accept the petition as presented. I'll Thank second. You. Thank you, Mr. Beasley. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Excellent. Item number six, accept an action regarding a deposit and reimbursement agreement by and between the city of Saginaw and Provident Realty Advisor. Uh, Gabe, you want to describe this real quick? This is uh, more or less an escrow of funds to pay for uh, site work, more or less. But it might sure, expound. It's, yeah. It's fa fairly straightforward. Yeah. Uh, initial deposit of $50,000, and it is a an account that's required to be replenished during the the negotiation and process to pay for all of the city's consultants associated with this PID right, so and the development agreement. Right, so this is not money out of the general fund. That's correct. This is not from the city of Saginaw. The taxpayers do not pay for this, so it's very important to know. And as, as Councilmember Farr asked earlier, if for some reason the district isn't created, we're not obligated to refund any legitimately spent money getting us to that point. Okay. Or illegitimately spent money. <laughs> goes without saying, but I wanted to say. Okay. Any other questions on number six? If not, I'll entertain a motion. All right. It's Mr. Tucker, second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? It is not. Number seven, considering an action regarding agreement for public improvement district administration services between the city of Saigon and P3 Works. Uh, we want anything we want to discuss on this? This is between uh, us and uh, Kyle's group. P3. Any questions on this? Any? And to pretty. confirm, Kyle's group is being funded by the district and the developer. Okay. All right. Any questions? Any other questions on number seven? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Can I make a motion to 
Is there any second? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Excellent. All right. We're in business. Mr. Mayor, yes, I sir. might recommend briefly that we go in executive session, talk specifically about uh, future negotiations for the development agreement. Sure. Yep. Um, I'm hopeful now that this will, we talked about making this real, this will make it a little more real, and also uh, this will move Provident toward a purchase of the land. Because that's the step I'm looking forward to make this real. Buy the land. Then we're real. So, all right, so at uh, 740, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071 and 551.087, we're in executive session. We will return to adjourn.
Everybody back? All right, at 8.08, we are back from executive session. Uh, we have no other questions for you guys. Thank you for your time. Sorry to keep you so late, but thanks for all the information. It was a good night. Uh, we're starting the process, so I think we look forward to it. If not, um, move we adjourn. Number nine. All right, we <laughs> motion to adjourn. All those in favor? 808, we're out of here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hey, turn off, turn off your lights.